It's incredible. It is amazing. And I just have to say, hallelujah. There is a God. And he speaks. He speaks to us. And he speaks to us because we need to hear from him. So hallelujah, he speaks to us. We need to hear from him. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 gives us magnificent truths. Awesome truths. This sentence is beautiful, wonderful, and it makes us praise our Father God and our Savior Jesus. But in order for us to recognize the magnitude of the statements that are made in these verses, we have to bring to the forefront of our attention some critical truths. And that's what I want to think on first here tonight. The Hebrew Christians to whom this letter was written would have had a background, a tradition, a lifestyle in the forefront of their mind that emphasized three main things that I want to point out that they just, they knew this. There was no doubt. They were always thinking about these three facts. Number one, there is a God. One God. This is the Shema. They repeated this and rehearsed it. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And they were to keep talking about these words and to repeat them every day and to their children walking on the road and to remember this. And they recited this Shema so they knew the Lord is God. There is one God. They also knew and were always very aware that our God is holy. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45 emphasizes this. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy and I love the holiness of God. It is his otherness. He is completely other than anything. It's kind of obvious. He's God. He made everything. So he's completely other. But that is one way to describe his holiness. It is his purity and his sinlessness. But it's also that he is completely other than anything. And the third thing that they were always very aware of was that sin separated man and woman from our holy God. Isaiah 59 two says, but your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God and your sins have made him hide his face from you so that he does not listen. There's a barrier. I have to spend some time reminding you of the repulsiveness of sin. You know what happened in the Garden of Eden. Temptation, doubt, rebellion, independence, self-centeredness, self-gratification, and pride all showed up. And Adam and Eve took the bait and they took a bite of what was forbidden. And ever since that time, Every baby boy and every baby girl has been born into this world diseased with sin, depraved. Do you use that word? Do you know that word? My father taught Sunday school and I can remember driving home from church and he'd be talking about the depravity of man. I'm a little girl in the back seat and I did not know what depravity meant. It's gross. <laughs> it's horrible. Um, does it bring disgusting descriptions of a person to mind? It should. But in case it doesn't, here are some synonyms for depravity. Corrupt, perverted, deviant, degenerate, immoral, unprincipled, reprobate, lewd, lustful, obscene, indecent, sordid, these are not pretty words. Wicked, sinful, vile, 
nefarious, criminal, vicious, brutal, warped, twisted, sick. And I didn't put it up there, but the last word in the list when I just looked at synonyms of depravity was sicko. Mm -hmm. That's appropriate. It is. A person who's sick with sin is sicko without Christ until they've been made a new creation and been changed. So we're staying on the topic of sin for a moment. And I have given you on your handout this quote from John MacArthur's Biblical Doctrine. The universal sinfulness of man is obvious and verifiable. Sin permeates every aspect of our existence. It impacts us individually and societally. It is deeply rooted within us and is manifested continually throughout history. Societies have consistently acknowledged man's natural sinfulness. Since the Enlightenment, however, Western civilization has become increasingly antagonistic antagonistic toward the reality of sin, especially as it is defined biblically. So let's make sure that we define sin the way the Bible does. What does the Bible say about sin? There are only two books and four chapters in the Bible that don't mention sin at all or sinners. Genesis 1 and 2, describing God's creation as good and very good. And Revelation 21 and 22, which describe the new heaven and the new earth, which will never be infected by sin. And everything else in between is tainted and sick with sin. The rest of the Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, show the impact of sin and the need for salvation. So sin must be understood from God's perspective. And at its very core, sin is a violation of God's plan. God, the creator, made man the creature. God created man to be in relationship with him as a dependent being. God created us to need him. And MacArthur says, and you've got this quote also on your handout, sin causes man to assume the role of God and to assert autonomy for himself apart from his creator. The most all-encompassing view of sin's driving force, therefore, is the demand for autonomy. This is the I can do it myself attitude. I don't need you. I don't want you. Or I don't want to do what you said attitude. This is in Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And what does God say? I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. We definitely sound like children when we say, I can do it myself, or I don't want to. 2 Thessalonians 2, 12 says, And so all of them who have not believed the truth but have delighted in evil will be condemned. And MacArthur gives this definition of sin. Sin is any lack of conformity to God's will in attitude, thought, or action, whether committed actively or passively. The center of all sin is autonomy, which is the replacing of God with self. And always closely associated with sin are its products, pride, selfishness, idolatry, and lack of peace. And there are many more disgusting results of sin. James 1, 14 and 15 tells us, each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Why were the Hebrew Christians to whom this letter was written, so very aware of the repulsiveness of sin and the need for purification, the need for atonement, for cleansing, for forgiveness. Why were they so aware of sin? 
they'd had about 2,000 years of offering sacrifices to try to get themselves cleaned up. Day after day, sin was always right in front of them. They had to make sacrifices to be cleansed from sin. Moses was told by God, and I have this long passage to read through. It's just going to highlight the command for daily sacrifice and weekly sacrifices. Moses was told by God, command the children of Israel and say to them, my offering, my food for my offerings made by fire as a sweet aroma to me, you shall be careful to offer them to me at their appointed time. And you shall say to them, the Israelites, this is the offering made by fire, which you shall offer to the Lord. Two male lambs in their first year without blemish day by day as a regular burnt offering. The one lamb you shall offer in the morning and the other lamb you shall offer in the evening. So every day the priests are making the morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice of the burnt offering. Verse six, it is a regular burnt offering which was ordained at Mount Sinai for a sweet aroma and offering made by fire to the Lord. Let's look at verse 8. The other lamb you shall offer in the evening as the morning grain offering and its drink offering. You shall offer it as an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. And verse 9, and on the Sabbath day, every week, every seventh day, two lambs in their first year without blemish and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil with its drink offering. This is the burnt offering for every Sabbath besides the regular burnt offering with its drink offering. This passage shows us the daily, twice a day offering, the Sabbath weekly offering, and then it continues to describe the offerings that are to be made at the beginning of each month and at each special, special festival, and then year after year on the Day of Atonement. So the sacrifices were being made over and over and over again. If you're familiar with the C.S. Lewis story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you'll remember that when Lucy Pevensey hid in the wardrobe and found herself in Narnia, it was snow-covered, frozen winter because the white witch had cursed the kingdom. Her heartless dominion ruled the land. Mr. Tumnus said to Lucy, it's winter in Narnia and has been for ever so long. Always winter, but never Christmas. And that caught Lucy by surprise. What? Never Christmas? No presents? No. There were no presents. There was no celebration. There was no joy. The Jews were in a winter of offering sacrifices to God. They were always offering and never forgiven. And we know this is the case because Hebrews 10, 4 tells us it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. I do want to acknowledge that the offerings were God's gift to the people. They were an accommodation for that period of time for the people to give them. Uh, It's called purification of the flesh. The book of Hebrews that we're in is going to call these offerings for the purification of the flesh. But this truth is that it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. This was the offerings were an accommodation for the time period until Christ came and was the sacrifice. So please try to grasp the situation that the Jewish people found themselves in. They knew there was one God one holy God. And they knew that sin was a never ending issue that separated them from God. Think about the tabernacle. Think about the temple, the gates, the walls, the barriers, the sections. Some priests could enter a portion of the tabernacle, the first part of the temple, but then the holy of holies, only one high priest once a year could even go in there. So separation was portrayed through the building and the structure and and God's instructions for his house. Now, with that in the forefront of our mind, 
there is a God, he is holy, and sin has separated man from God. Let's listen to the first words that the author wrote to the Hebrews again. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. These statements touch on the whole history of the Israelite people. They're based on everything that we've learned in the Old Testament from Genesis 1 through the end of Malachi. God spoke to the fathers because they needed him. They needed to hear from him. And now God has spoken to us by his son. We need to pause on that statement. God is one. It was blasphemous to the Jews for Jesus to be called the son of God. Blasphemy was the charge that the priests held against Jesus as the reason for his death. And here's the account. Jesus is standing before the high priest. Jesus was silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. He is setting him up. He is, wants Jesus to say, I am. Jesus didn't say it quite like that. Jesus said to him, you have said so. That means you said it. You got that right. <laughs> and then Jesus said, I tell you, from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And that was also equivalent to him stating, I am the son of God. The high priest tore his robes and said he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. It was not blasphemy. <laughs> Jesus is the son of God. This name, this title, this description, this identity is the height of exaltation. And this is something that I have enjoyed reflecting on and pondering, not just thinking he is the son born in Bethlehem, the baby Jesus, but to be the son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He is that pre-incarnate, eternally, before he was born and walked on earth. He is the son of God. I won't, I've given you on the back of your handout um, statements, commentary actually, by Adolf Sefer. He was a Hebrew by birth and saved by grace, and it's a description of Jesus the Son. And I want to read this, and he just, because he is a Hebrew, and he's commentating on Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, and the way that he puts things is so wonderful. I just wanted to read it in his words, so you can follow along with me. Adolf Sefer says, Now the time of fragmentary, imperfect, and temporary revelation is past. God speaks to us now in another and more glorious manner. Look at the contrast. The whole contrast is in one word. In our language, one syllable by the Son. One syllable, Son. The prophets were many. The Son is one. The prophets were servants. The Son is the Lord. The prophets were temporary. The Son abideth forever. The prophets were imperfect. The Son is perfect, even as the Father is perfect. The prophets were guilty. The Son is not merely pure, but able to purify those that are full of sin and pollution. The prophets point to the future. The Son points to himself and says, here am I. God has spoken to us by his son. He is the only prophet. God asks, who is like unto me? To whom then will ye liken me or shall I be equal? God asks, proud man, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who is there that knows God or is equal to him? None but the son. 
He was with him before the foundations of the world were laid. The eternal, uncreated word was with God before the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy. He is the true and faithful witness, for he speaks of that which he hath seen and testifies of that which he knows. No man knoweth the Father but the Son. No man hath seen the Father, the only begotten of the Father. He hath declared him. He's not merely the true and faithful witness because he's from everlasting. He is also the beloved of God. Notice this in the word son. The only begotten, says John, who was in the bosom of the father, who is his treasure and delight, the infinite object of his love, in whom from all eternity was his rejoicing, who shares with him all his counsels, this beloved one of God Oh, surely he is the true messenger who will reveal all the secrets of the Father's heart and who will tell unto us all the fullness of his counsel and all the purposes of his grace. God hath spoken to us by his Son. Now, when the apostle, by the way, Savior thinks that Paul wrote Hebrews, so he's calling them the apostle as the author of the letter. When the apostle has given us this idea of the wonderful glory of the Lord Jesus, the Son whom God has appointed heir of all things, by whom he has made the worlds, who is the brightness of his glory and the express image of his being, who upholdeth and moveth all things by the word of his power, he continues by stating something still more marvelous. Why has this wonderful and glorious being, in whom all things are summed up, and who is before all things the Father's delight and the Father's glory, why has this infinite light, this infinite power, this infinite majesty come down to our poor earth? For what purpose? To shine? To show forth the splendor of his majesty? To teach heavenly wisdom? To rule by his just and holy might? He's going to do all those things. But no, he came to purge our sins. What height of glory, what depth of abasement. Infinite is his majesty and infinite is his self-humiliation and the depth of his love. What a glorious Lord and what an awful sacrifice of unspeakable love to purge our sins by himself. Sin has brought him down from heaven. Think on that statement. Sin is that which is loathsome to God, which fills his inmost being with repulsion. Who can take it out of the way and cleanse the sinners so that they appear pure and spotless in God's sight? None but the Son of God. Amazing love, right? Amazing grace. Love and grace. Those words are not used in this first passage. But that's the heart, that's the action that God took. He acted from his love. He acted with his grace. We will continue to be amazed and overwhelmed with the Son of God when we think about his divine attributes. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God. And we need to practice saying that, reminding of our, ourselves of that. So we're going to look at the attributes of God the Father, which are also the attributes of God the Son. This is probably familiar territory when you're thinking of God. God is, like for example, He is eternal. Well, Jesus is eternal. Micah 5, 2, it actually says this when it's talking about the prophecy of Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. And John 1, 1 says it so well, so clearly for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
so. God the Father is eternal. God the Son is eternal. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is glorious. In John 17, 5, he says, Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. Now, clearly, that verse could be used for his eternality, his pre-existence as well. Jesus is gracious. John 1, 14, The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And he gives us grace upon grace. Jesus is holy. And look who calls him holy here. Luke 4, 34. Leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus Nazarene? These are the demons speaking to him. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And the people are saying in John 6, 69, we have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus is unchanging. Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, tells the story of what happened. The Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. I also could have put the one in there from Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is life. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Jesus is love. John 15, 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Jesus is merciful. Hebrews 2, 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus is merciful. He is om omnipotent, all powerful. Hebrews 1, 2 and 3, you read these verses, but highlight the part through whom God created the world. And Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is omnipotent. And he is omnipresent. Matthew eighteen twenty, He says, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And Jesus is omniscient. And this was demonstrated when, in John 1, 47, 48, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And Nathanael's like, Oh, wow. <laughs> Jesus is like, You're going to see even greater things than that. Jesus is righteous. Acts 3.14 Peter said to the men of Israel, you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. This was at Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus is self-existent. John 1, 1 through 3. I've already read John 1, 1. And 2 says he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. He had to exist if he is the one who made everything else. There is logic in that. Jesus is sovereign. Ephesians 1.21 tells us that God put him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Jesus is sovereign. And Jesus is truth. He says it of himself. John fourteen six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father 
except through me. These are the attributes of God. Jesus has the same attributes as God the Father because Jesus is God. So let the title, the identity of Jesus as Son of God be elevated and exalted and expanded and don't keep it. If, if you were thinking of Jesus as a baby, a son, then go beyond that. Hebrews 7, 26 says, For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. There's another summary of who Jesus is. It reflects what has been written already in the first words of Hebrews. So the author there writes them and reminds us again of who the man Jesus is. He is the son of God that he brought to our attention in his first words of Hebrews 1. So how do we respond to him? I want to close and let you um, pray along with the Puritan who was writing, and this is recorded in the Valley of Vision. And, uh, and this is a prayer, and it's a response, and it's what you want to do in response to who Jesus is. The title that they've given this prayer is Christ is All. And the opening line is, oh, lover to the uttermost. So I'm just setting the stage, but I encourage you to bow your heads, pray along. I will read and pause so that, and this is something that someone taught me as a child, like when you're listening to someone pray, so that you don't drift away. <laughs> Repeat the words of the prayer. Repeat what they're praying. So make it your own as you hear this. Repeat it and pray it back to God, um, just silently, but I will read it slowly and then you'll know that we've come to the end when I say amen. It's just two pages. <laughs> oh, lover to the uttermost, may I read the meltings of thy heart to me in the manger of thy birth, in the garden of thy agony, in the cross of thy suffering, in the tomb of thy resurrection, in the heaven of thy intercession. Bold in this thought, I defy my adversary. Tread down his temptations. Resist his schemings. Renounce the world. And valiant for truth. Deepen in me a sense of my holy relationship to thee. A spiritual bri bridegroom. A sinner's friend. I think of thy glory and my vileness. Thy majesty and my meanness. Thy beauty and my deformity thy purity and my filth, thy righteousness and my iniquity. Thou hast loved me everlastingly, unchangeably. May I love thee as I am loved. Thou hast given thyself for me. May I give myself to thee. Thou hast died for me. May I live to thee. In every moment of my time. In every movement of my mind. In every pulse of my heart. May I never dally with the world and its allurements. But walk by thy side. Listen to thy voice. Be clothed with thy graces and adorned with thy righteousness. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.